Welcome back to another video, video. Here, I'm going to be reacting to another banger by Mr. Ballin. Shoutouts to Greg. Greg Milsik. I don't know if I pronounced your last name right. Please let me know if I pronounced your last name right. Shoutouts to you. You also had gave me some suggestion videos. Three in the exact. But unfortunately, I watched all three already. Behind closed doors, behind the scenes, I'd be watching Mr. Balin. So, but I find a video I haven't seen yet. So, shout outs to you, Greg. I'm going to be putting on this recent new video that he had published, which is called He Experienced the Worst Medical Screw Up Ever. So, I could imagine what kind of procedure he's going to get into himself lord here we go but yeah i'm gonna get straight into this video before we get straight into this video make sure you like subscribe and stay tuned because i post new bangers all the time so yeah let's get straight into it In the late 1800s, a deadly phenomenon was occurring in America. Fire departments were beginning to use these large safety nets that resembled these huge circular stretches of canvas to try to save people that were stuck in burning buildings. During a multi-story fire, these firefighters would show up and they would get out this big net and they would all take up positions around it, holding onto the edges, and then they would move it directly underneath one of the windows of the burning building, and then they would call out to the people inside to jump out of the window on to yo that's crazy imagine but what if the building is too high up and they don't have that depth like say for instance they have it right it's like a parachute in a way right so what if the building is too far up what what else do they do do they have a plan b for that because i get this one but this would be like hella scary because what if you didn't aim right and Odd. the net and then when they jumped the firefighters would make sure to maneuver the net to try to catch the person right in the middle breaking their fall and saving their lives however the deadly phenomenon was that these people who were stuck in these buildings were more afraid to make the jump onto the net than they were of the fire and so despite the firefighters constant urges to please just jump they would stay put and they would die in the fire. And so fire departments all over America were desperately trying to... Because there are some people who are afraid of heights too. That is scary. Oh my God. And especially if you're on the tall, like the tall buildings. Mm -mm find ways to educate the American public about the relative safety of these nets. That certainly making this jump is a better bet than staying in an actively burning building. But despite their efforts, Americans were still staying put in these buildings and dying unnecessarily. In 1883, which was around the time of this deadly phenomenon, a diving instructor working out of Washington, D.C., named Robert Odlum, heard about this issue, and he thought to himself, you know, if Americans just maybe saw someone make the jump successfully, they wouldn't be afraid anymore. And since Robert was a diving instructor and so was very comfortable jumping from heights, he thought, well, who better to make these demonstrations than me? And so, in collaboration with several Washington, D.C. fire departments, Robert began hosting these demonstrations where he would leap out of multi-story buildings onto the safety net. And very quickly, these demonstrations began attracting very big crowds, but not because they wanted the education of the event. They just wanted to see. They lost track. The audience lost track of what was going on. What was the main reason for this 
this scene. See someone jump out of a building onto a net. It was like a circus act. And Robert, who was not expecting this to happen, found himself really enjoying the attention he was garnering. And so pretty quickly, he stopped doing demonstrations to show off fire net safety and instead began jumping off of huge bridges into bodies of water just because people thought it was awesome. He was becoming this celebrity in Washington, D.C. And soon, Robert began taking his show all over the country, basically touring to all these bridges all over. Well, he's a professional, so he's getting his coins. So I don't blame him. America, and he would put out these flyers all over the city, encouraging people to show up to the bridge on the day of his jump. And then when he would get to the bridge, there'd be hundreds and hundreds of people cheering him on. But Robert's very unlikely and rapid rise to fame and fortune quickly spawned copycats. And in 1885, so two years after Robert had begun this jumping venture, his popularity was beginning to wane because he was no longer as unique. Before, it was really just him doing these jumps, and now he was kind of a commodity. And so feeling desperate to become relevant again, Robert thought to himself, you know, I gotta do something that sets me apart from all the other bridge jumpers. I gotta do something that nobody else has done, that way I can once again. He needs to find his niche. I, I feel you. I understand what he's guiding through. I understand where he's trying to, like, you know, take part of for his profession again become the bridge jumper. And it just so happened there was a bridge that had recently been constructed in New York called the Brooklyn Bridge that was massive. It spanned 1,600 feet from Brooklyn across the East River to New York City, and at its highest point, it was a whopping 130 feet off of the water. And so if Robert made that jump, he would actually set the record for the highest bridge jump ever. But by this point, bridge that beat came in. You already know this is gonna turn or twist into a whole nother story. Bridge jumping had become popular enough that police had caught on to it and they had made it illegal, mostly to protect the bridge jumpers from themselves. And so any time police saw advertisements for an upcoming bridge jump, they would show up to the location on the day of the jump in force and they would stop the jumper from jumping. And so Robert knew this, but he still needed to get the word out about this big Brooklyn Bridge jump. And so he created a very clever word of mouth campaign amongst people in New York, and he also began handing out these flyers that were fairly cryptic, but still told people where to go and at what time for this big spectacle they were going to see. And on May 19th of that year, the day of the jump, Robert's underground advertising campaign had worked beautifully. By early that morning, the Brooklyn Bridge was covered with hundreds and hundreds of people. Also down on the banks as well, there's all these people who are all waiting to see Robert make this record-setting jump. Robert had become a bit of a showman since he began doing these bridge jumps, and he had developed a sort of trademark entrance. He would arrive in a black horse and carriage, and then once it stopped on the bridge, he would leap out, and he'd be wearing this long coat, and he would take it off, revealing his swimsuit. Swagger man, he had a star boy one time, well, sure enough. And the crowd would cheer, Big and then he would wave on. to the crowd, and then he would just run to the edge and leap off the bridge. And so on May 19th, all these people who are waiting for Robert, they're looking for this black horse and carriage, and around noontime... I feel like he made a different entranceway because probably the police already know how he come about in the show, right? So he probably switch it up. Smart, smart someone spotted it. It was coming onto the bridge from the Brooklyn side, and then once it stopped on the bridge, the door flung open, and Robert leapt out in his big coat. He ripped his coat off, revealing his swimsuit. The crowd was going wild. Everyone was so pumped about this. He's waving and getting ready, and he starts running to the railing to make this jump, and before he jumps, the police swarm him and arrest him. The police were not dumb. They had caught on to this underground advertising campaign. And the way he said it sounded like a Torontonian. Well, the police is not dumb. What are you doing? What are you trying to do? But that's crazy.
So like everyone else, they were out in force on this bridge. There were all these officers everywhere. And so as soon as they saw this carriage, they immediately rushed over, intercepted it, and they stopped him. And so as they're arresting Robert, the crowd is starting to boo and they're chanting, let him jump, let him jump. And the police who are all kind of gathered on the Brooklyn side of the bridge, they're telling people to start to disperse. And as they're doing this, something incredible happens. On the far other side of the bridge, on the New York side of the bridge, another oh, black shit. horse and carriage had just come to a stop. He ain't dumb, he ain't dumb. <laughs> this man tricked police them and made a don't care, don't kill me. Some psychic to play the part for the first scene so I could just do the other part. So I could get through with the other scene. Oh my god. This guy is clever. He had a plan B to a plan C. Don't kill me. Wow on the bridge. The doors had flung open and a man had jumped out wearing a long coat. He had ripped it off, revealing a swimsuit and the crowd went wild. It was the real Robert Odlum. That's the man crazy. the police had arrested was actually an actor that Robert had paid to pretend to be him. Robert had told him to show up at a particular time and make the typical entrance that he would in order to suck all the police to that side of the bridge. And then while that was happening, Robert would show up and have enough time and space to make the jump and his plan had worked perfectly and so the police who are on the brooklyn side they see this happening and they realize there's no way they can run all the way across the bridge and stop robert before he makes the jump and so like everyone else they just kind of walked to the railing and they watched and so the real robert after revealing his swimsuit he waved to the crowd he's smiling everyone's going crazy and he runs over to the railing he climbs onto the other side and he's looking out over the water and he gives one more wave to everyone down below in boats and on the banks and on the sides of the bridge and everyone's going crazy and then he jumps onlookers would later say that at first his jump was that beat what's gonna happen did he not make it perfect as soon as he leapt off the bridge like he always did he put his right arm straight over his head and he tucked his left arm by his side this allowed him to stay in an upright vertical position as he fell but just a second into his fall a strong gust of wind blew robert off his access and suddenly he was falling on his side now it's important to understand bridge jumpers when they jump from really high heights they need to land feet first in a vertical position this allows their feet to to, quote break the surface tension of the water before the rest of their body it's like a wall in a way elastic it's elastic wall so i get what he's saying one time i jumped from a pool belly first that shit hurts belly first so i could imagine this the tension hopefully it makes it because boy mm -mm comes crashing down and if they do it that way the water functions much like the firefighters safety net it will break the jumpers fall and save their life but if the jumper lands at basically any other angle the water tension will not break fast enough before the rest of their body hits the surface of the water and so the water instead of functioning like a net that will save them will actually function like concrete so after this gust of wind had blown like robert onto his side he began flailing in midair to try to get himself back to his upright vertical position but he couldn't do it in time and so he slammed into the water directly on his right oh. side and when the crowd saw this they figured something was wrong but they didn't really know and so everyone just kind of gasped and waited to see what would happen next and they're looking and then finally Robert emerges from the deep except he's face down and he's motionless and so some of Robert's friends who were on a boat below they leapt into the water they swam over to Robert they pulled him back to the boat they got him up on the deck and when they looked at him he looked awful there was blood coming out of his mouth he was barely conscious and he would just say to them did i make a good jump and then he would die an autopsy would reveal that robert's impact with the surface of the water had basically obliterated all of his insides amongst other things his liver his spleen and both his kidneys had ruptured and all of the ribs on his right side were broken a year later another hey. bridge jumper named larry donovan would make the jump off of the brooklyn bridge and survive setting the record for the highest bridge jump at the time.
In 1978, 49-year-old Georgi Markov, who was originally from Bulgaria, was living in London and working as a reporter for the British Broadcasting Company, or BBC for short. Georgi had moved to London six years earlier, and in the early days of him being in the UK, he would always take a cab or a bus to work. But over the last couple of years, he had taken to walking to work. Not only was it great exercise, but he also just loved the scenery. In particular, he liked on his commute to stop on the Waterloo Bridge, this very famous bridge in London, where from that position, he had a beautiful view of the Westminster Palace on one side, and he had the iconic London Eye on the other, which is a very famous Ferris wheel. So that one million views he has, could I imagine how much that house was made? How much that house is cost? Which money? On the morning of September 7th of that year, Georgie got up and he left his flat and he began his typical commute into work. However, by the time he reached the Waterloo Bridge and was getting ready to take in the sights, it had started to rain and Georgie did not have an umbrella. And so instead of sightseeing, he just kept on walking as quickly as he could to try to get to his office before he got completely soaked. But by the time he was just on the other side of the Waterloo Bridge and still had quite a distance to cover to get to work, the skies had completely completely opened up and so as much as Georgie wanted to walk because this was something he really enjoyed he decided the name Georgie it reminds me of the movie it. Georgie <laughs> It was not worth it. And so he began looking for a bus stop and he found one pretty quickly and he rushed over to it. There was an awning that the commuters could stand underneath. And so he ran underneath this awning, getting out from under the rain. And then he proceeded to wait for the next bus to take him the rest of the way. As he stood there waiting, he suddenly felt a shooting pain in the back of his right thigh. And instinctively, without even knowing what- He got shocked by lightning. That's different. That's what I'm guessing, I don't know. It's just a random guess, I'm guessing. It was, he just reached down and grabbed his leg, but he couldn't feel anything. And then he tried to kind of look around and look down at his leg, but it was just too crowded around him. So he really couldn't do it. And so he's standing there puzzled, still grabbing at his leg, wondering what could have caused this pain. And the only things he could think of were, you know, maybe someone near him had a pen or a pencil out and they accidentally poked him, or maybe it's some sort of bug that bit him, a spider or a bee or something. He didn't know, but there weren't that many scenarios that made sense sense to him. But before he could spend very much time dwelling on what had caused this, the bus arrived and Georgie turned around, he hopped on board, and by the time the bus pulled up in front of his office building and he had gone through the doors of the BBC, Georgie had effectively forgotten about this pain in his leg. But when he got up to his actual desk and sat down on his chair, when the underside of his thigh made contact with his chair, it sent that shooting pain into his leg and immediately he noticed it. It was almost like he had a splinter stuck in the back of his thigh and by pressing it down on the seat, it was driving that splinter deeper into his leg. And so Georgie stood up immediately and he's grabbing at the back of his leg and he's kind of craning his head to look down at the back of his leg, but you know, he doesn't and see anything there and so he's standing there wondering what he should do he's got a really busy day ahead of him and he's he's thinking that is weird but we do things and we don't even realize we get hurt so like a scratch a light scratch or anything like that and we look at our skin and be like oh I scratch myself I guess so for him to have a sharp pain that is very odd to be honest you know, should I maybe go to the bathroom and see what this is? But then he tells himself, you're overthinking it. This has got to be something minor. You know, I need to get to work. And so he sat back down in his chair, being very careful with his right leg when he placed it down so as not to press too hard on the spot that hurt. And then he just got to work. And over the course of several hours, even though he knew there was kind of a dull, aching pain. He probably thinks it was a cramp or something. I don't know because this is very odd. In the back of his leg, he mostly forgot about it. He was just doing his job. But by the second half of the day, in the early afternoon, the pain in his leg had become so excruciating that Georgie was literally gritting his teeth and sweating profusely in order to try to ignore the pain. But at some point- He probably got cut, a big, big cut, and did not know. And he, while doing his day-to-day -day basis, but, and slowly the affection it got into affection or something because if he's sweating profusely 
that should show signs you got caught or something or has a big sore or something that is some well need to look at for sure instead of working they can replace you buddy work on yourself before you work on work to be honest because you never know you could drop down they go and rehire another person just to tell you just to let you know but at some point it just became too much he couldn't focus on work and so he stood up he left his desk and he walked down the hall and he went into the single stall bathroom and once he went inside and he shut the door behind him he pulled his pants down and turned around and looked in the mirror to use the reflection to look at the back of his leg and right away there was a little bit of a relief there because what he saw was a little bit of redness a little bit of swelling but nothing significant it looked very much like someone must have hit him with a pencil by accident or maybe it was a bee sting or a spider bite or something but whatever it was it was definitely minor at least in georgie's mind and so he pulls his pants back up he tucks his shirt back in he leaves the bathroom and goes back to his desk and then he sits down and despite this intense pain in his leg he's convinced himself it's no big deal and so he just kind of grits his way through the rest of his workday. when he finally got home again and walked through the door georgie's wife looked at him and was like what's wrong with you he was so pale he was sweating profusely he looked awful and so he told her about what had happened with his leg and he was still trying to kind of write it off but she told him georgie you are sick there's something wrong we have to go to the hospital right now and so at this point georgie was miserable and so he agreed to go and so the pair they made their way over to the emergency room at the hospital they go inside and a doctor pulled georgie into an exam room and said okay you know tell me what's going on why are you here and georgie would explain how in his morning commute he had stopped at this bus stop and then felt this shooting pain and then he told the doctor you know i'm pretty convinced this is someone who might have accidentally jabbed me with a pen or a pencil or it's a bug bite a spider bite i don't know he probably got shocked by lightning and don't even realize that there's some sort i don't know I don't know. Because why are you going to tell us about, oh, it started raining? And I don't know. It's weird. It's a weird story, to be honest. It's interesting. Not weird. Interesting. Curious. Very, very curious what it is but i'm convinced it's something minor and so the doctor he hears this and he asks georgie to stand up pull his pants down so the doctor can get a look at the site and so georgie does he gets up he drops his pants and then as the doctor bends down and begins looking at the back of his thigh georgie kind of turns around and looks down and he's shocked at what he sees even though he does not have a full view of the back of his leg it's obvious that the swelling and redness on the back of his leg has grown exponentially it looks totally horrible and so after a couple of minutes of the doctor looking at the back of his leg the doctor stands up and looks puzzled and tells georgie hold on a minute i need somebody else to get a look at this and so the doctor goes out into the main hall he comes back with another doctor and that doctor comes over he bends down and he looks at the back of georgie's leg as well and after the two of them kind of talk to each other and they're looking at the back of his leg they stand up and they walk around and they're facing georgie now and they say okay this is going to sound totally weird but when you were at the bus stop before you felt the pain in your leg was anyone around you holding a snake or a reptile i know that sounds crazy but the mark on the back of your leg looks exactly like a venomous bite so georgie's like no i didn't see anyone with snakes or reptiles there was nothing out of the ordinary about what was happening around me when i felt you never know people with pet snakes and stuff you never know you never know, and especially if you're waiting by the bus, public bus. You never know who has pets for who. So with that, that could be, that could happen. That could be accurate. That could, what? That's crazy. Now I'm going to be wearing tights underneath my pants and stuff. Because what? this pain in my leg we were all just standing there and then i felt it in my leg that was it and so the doctors would tell georgie that you know they didn't really know what was going on with his leg and so the best thing to do here is just to georgie. admit him to the hospital and monitor him and you know try to run some tests on him and try to make him comfortable and so that night georgie was admitted to the hospital he was set up in his own hospital room and right away the nurses and doctors began administering different combinations of medicines and treatments to try to lower the swelling and the pain in 
in his leg, but it just seemed like nothing was working. And so all night, his condition seemed to get worse, not better. And then the next day when he woke up, his leg was much, much worse. It was extremely swollen. It almost looked like a balloon that had been completely filled. It was very red. And Georgie himself was also beginning to lose touch with reality. He had become convinced that someone had tried to kill him and that was why he was so sick. And this delusion of his got so extreme that he was afraid of his doctors and nurses. And so it became a big challenge trying to help him because he was effectively fighting them off. By the next day, Georgie's condition overall had become critical. He was very clearly... I think the side affection, I said side affection, side effect was hallucin ugh, hallucination by this bite. Cause that's, that's crazy. He definitely had hallucination by this bite, whatever it is affecting his leg to swallow up like that. That's crazy. On the brink of death and his mind was effectively gone. But the doctors and the nurses really had no idea what was going on with him, and so there was nothing they could do to help him. And then on the last day he was in the hospital, the third day, Georgie would die. His body just shut down. Given the strangeness of Georgie's death, his body was sent for an autopsy to try to figure out what had caused that leg pain because that seemed to be the trigger that ultimately killed him. And sure enough, during the autopsy, the coroner made yeah. a surprising discovery. Buried in the back of his right leg, right underneath the site that was where he felt the pain, was this little piece of metal. It was so small, the coroner actually almost didn't see it. But when he did see it, he put it under the microscope and what he saw was this obviously man-made metallic disc that had these two small reservoirs drilled into it and so they sent this disc off for further testing and what they discovered was there was ricin residue inside of those two reservoirs ricin is an extremely powerful poison it is more lethal than cyanide and it has no antidote and the symptoms of ricin poisoning often look like so he could be right. Someone tried to kill him. So this is a murder then, I guess. Cause what kind, what type? That's, that's crazy. Unless it's like he leaned on something and then after it, it joked him and he didn't even realize. I don't know. That's weird. That's weird. ...of other diseases or illnesses, and so it's very difficult to diagnose. And so as a result of these factors, ricin is a very popular poison for assassinations. And the belief is that that is exactly what happened to Georgie. He was assassinated. But to this day, we don't... So he was right. He was right. That's terrible. ...actually know who assassinated him. However, the running theory is that Georgie, who was a... For why? Does the wife know? Like, what they were, why would have somebody come for his neck? Because that's, that's crazy. We don't actually know who assassinated him. However, the running theory is that Georgie, who was a reporter for the oh, BBC... Oh, that one's... All you could tell me... Just tell me his profession. He probably had a story that he had that someone didn't want everybody to let out, to let it be known. But he was still was going to run with it. And that's why he probably got assassinated. That's crazy. For the BBC, he covered politics and he politics often... especially. Politics? Politics. Lord have mercy, don't let me get me started with that. Spoke very critically about the Soviet Union. And so this theory goes that the Soviet Union's intelligence agency, known as the KGB, they assassinated Georgie for what he was writing about. Adding credence to this theory. I wonder what he was about to, like, what he was writing about and what he was about to release. Hmm. Probably something really, really serious. That is crazy. For a story. Take that in. They killed the man for the truth, basically. Kind of, of the truth. If you really take it in. Because if it wasn't the truth, they wouldn't be getting at his head. So, to take that in, that's crazy. 
a former KGB officer named Oleg Kaligan, who was exiled to the United States in 1991, he claimed that he oversaw the assassination program that targeted Georgi Markov. He said what they did is they put this little tiny disc, that metal disc with the ricin inside of it, they put that at the tip of an umbrella and they made sure the disc itself was fairly sharp. And then the KGB oh, assassin shoot. with this umbrella simply followed Georgi on his typical morning commute. And then when he stopped at that bus stop, the assassin jabbed him in the back of the leg. Ah. This is why you have to watch where you're going because you never know, especially at nighttime. Oh my God. But it can't even be at nighttime. This is daytime too, broad daytime. But it was crowded. That's why I say you have to watch yourself all the time. Always watch your back, especially if you're alone. Watch your back. Watch your back because this could happen. This is crazy. I can't stop saying crazy. And then faded into the crazy. crowd. According to Oleg, those little metallic discs that had the ricin inside of them, they were actually covered with a thin layer of wax. And only when this disc had been placed inside of the target's body would their body heat melt that wax layer off, exposing the poison. And then their target would die several days later, as Georgie did. However, Oleg's story, despite being as compelling as it was, didn't have any hard proof to back it up. And so to this day, there has been no one officially charged with Georgi Markov's murder. Terrible. 16 minutes. In 2006, 73 year old Sherman Sizemore was the definition of a man's man. He had spent the bulk of his adult life doing one of the most dangerous jobs in the world, mining for coal in West Virginia. And while mining is just a whole nother, a whole nother. It's like scuba diving, the cave scuba diving. I forgot what, what it's called, but you guys know what I mean. Especially those people who go in cave, it's basically like that, but without water. I couldn't do this. Kudos to both of y'all to be doing while discovering things under caves and exploring caves and stuff. Kudos to you because I cannot do those type of things. I'm sorry. He was a coal miner. He apparently had lost track of the amount of times he had nearly been killed from mine shaft collapse and gas leaks. Later on in life, after his kids had all grown up, he had retired from coal mining and become an ordained Baptist minister. And despite his harrowing backstory and burly, intimidating appearance, he was known to be incredibly gentle and very calming to his parishioners. He was also known to be an incredibly devoted grandfather to the point where if there was a chance to spend time with his grandkids, he would basically throw all of his responsibilities out the window to do that. But in January of that year, something changed in Sherman. He went from being this pillar in the community to being a deranged, paranoid lunatic. It all started on the afternoon of January 19th. Sherman and his wife, Ruby, were sitting in their home alone on the couch, just kind of doing their own things, when suddenly, out of the blue, Sherman just starts screaming as if he sees something in front of him that's terrifying him and his scream startled Ru he probably saw something that would trigger his memory of working in one of the mines probably i don't know that's what i'm guessing Ruby so that she started screaming and so she looks at her husband and he's still just looking straight out ahead he's terrified of something in front of him and so ruby looks from him to where he's looking and there's nothing there. And so she turns back to her husband and she's like, what's going on? What are you screaming for? What are you so scared of? But Sherman wasn't able to speak. After he stopped screaming, he just continued to look straight out as if whatever had terrified him had him in this trance where he couldn't look away. And so his eyes are wide, his mouth is open, his face is going. Probably seeing you know, a ghost. I don't know. A demon. I don't know. This is really different. Whitey's starting to sweat and Ruby's starting to panic. She has no idea what's happening with him. And so eventually she just holds on to him and says, come back to me, come back to me. And Sherman at some point would, he kind of broke out of his trance and he looked at his wife and he just says, you can't leave me or they'll kill me. Ruby has never seen behavior like this in her husband ever. This is a completely different. Is he talking about demons? You can't leave me or they will kill me. That is different. I don't know. That's weird. 
different person she's interacting with, and so she has no idea what to do. And so instead, she just kind of holds on to Sherman and prays that he doesn't start acting like that again. But that didn't happen. All day long, periodically, he would just start screaming about something that Ruby couldn't see. Now, Ruby did consider- No, that would scare me. If my husband out of nowhere, out of the blue, starts screaming, I'd be like, oh, you good? Like, I would have heart attacks too. Especially if it was in the middle of the night too. I would jump out of my sleep while trying to catch myself, but at the same time trying to catch my him as well. I couldn't imagine how Ruby felt. Oh my God. As she, why? consider calling 911 and getting medics out there but his behavior was so unusual and he was normally such a rock who was so competent who was so healthy that she didn't want to she felt like he would just kind of get through this that if they can just get through today and get into tomorrow that he would be better and so she just all day was comforting him and just dealing with these episodes and then finally they got into bed that night and ruby's thinking thank goodness we're going to wake up tomorrow and things will be better but when she woke up the next morning it was very obvious Sherman had not slept at all. He was looking straight up at the ceiling. He looked worse than the day before. It was obvious. He's traumatized by something. He probably saw a demon and didn't even know how to, re how to act. Like, you know? That's crazy that he was not back to normal. And so Ruby called the rest of the family and had them come over to figure out what they were going to do. But when Sherman found out his family was coming to his house, he told Ruby they can't come inside. He was afraid they and others were conspiring to bury him alive. The only person he could be around was Ruby and his whole family had no- Bury him alive. He's talking about his ex coworkers that worked in the cave mining i don't know that's weird no idea what to do little did they know there was actually a very specific reason he was acting the way he was a few months before january 19th which was the day sherman turned into this different person a few months earlier he began complaining of severe abdominal pains and so he and his wife ruby and his daughter they went to the hospital and the doctor after examining him and running some tests determined that most like hallucinations i don't know likely his pain was coming from his gallbladder but the only way to be sure would be to do some exploratory surgery and literally look inside of Sherman's gut and look at his gallbladder and see if that was the problem and so the doctor asked Sherman you know are you prepared to do an exploratory surgery or would you like to just kind of wait it out and see what happens with this pain and so Sherman talked it over with his wife and his family and they made the decision that the pain was just too much and so they would go forward with the surgery and so on the morning yeah, going undercut is not my cup of tea. I never, I pray I don't ever do any surgical situations with my body because Lord have mercy. I hear stories that it could go wrong. Some people left scissors inside them. Sorry, my video, my device just cut off out of the blue. I don't know what's going on. I know for a fact it's not no paranormal type of thing that's going on with my phone. I don't know, but we're going to get straight back into this video putting the IV into his arm. Then at some point, one of the nurses lowered the oxygen mask onto Sherman's face so the anesthesiologist could administer the two drug cocktail that would knock him out for the surgery. Sherman was scheduled to get something known as general anesthesia for this operation, where basically he- He probably still had anesthesia still kicking up on him, still acting and seeing things out of the blue, probably. That's why he's acting like this. He would be completely out. He wouldn't feel anything. They'd do the surgery and then he would wake up and recover. Did he, did they put too much? That's my only concern. Probably, they probably put too much, gave him too much of the anesthesia. And so once this mask was on Sherman's face, the anesthesiologist began pumping him full of the drugs that would make him be knocked out for the surgery. However, the anesthesiologist only administered one of the two drugs necessary for oh, general shoot. anesthesia. Oh. He administered the paralyzing drug. So he's feeling everything. Oh. Oh. So he, they're feel, 
he's feeling the cut they feel no wonder why he's traumatized he's definitely traumatized and he can't talk too because that's crazy you see why i can't i can't do surgical no no surgical procedure on my body at all at all this is why this is one of the reasons they forget and they think they've done it because they've done it so many times they've probably programmed to think oh yeah i already done it stories check off this part okay i did that anesthesia but they forgot to put the other part for him to not feel anything lord have mercy Mm -mm. this family better sue that's all i have to say but he did not administer the actual anesthetic that would knock him out and most importantly would get rid of all of they were well carry on a whole conversation that's probably what what happened as well the nurse was talking too much with the the um, with him and forgot to put the second dose for him to not feel anything oh this pain and so as this mask is on his face and sherman believes he's being given the proper dosage of drugs the nurse who was nearby told sherman to go ahead and start counting backwards in his head from 10 knowing full well that sherman would pass out before he reached zero and sherman knew this too he had been in surgery before and so he happily began counting in his head 10 nine eight he started to feel something mm -hmm. seven six five four it was like he's in a deep what is it called again lucid dream basically and and that's scary he is in a lucid dream where he could feel everything basically that is crazy four three two one boom he was out except he wasn't when he reached zero in his head counting down he realized he had not passed out. He began taking mental stock of what was going on, and he realized he could completely feel his body. But when he tried to move his body, he couldn't. He was completely paralyzed. When he tried to make a sound, he couldn't because his vocal cords were also paralyzed. The only thing he could move were his eyes. He could move them left and right. However, they had taped his eyes shut, so he can't see anything. And so Sherman is thinking to himself, okay, you know, I've been given the drugs, maybe they're slow acting, any minute now, I'm gonna drift off to sleep and this will just be a distant memory. But after a few seconds, he's hearing the doctors and nurses in the room, he can't see them, but he hears them. They seem to be moving towards doing this operation and he's still awake. And so Sherman becomes frantic and starts flicking his eyes left and right as fast as he possibly can. And the rap- These sound effects need to stop. Because, oh my god. Rapid eye movement actually loosened the tape on both of his eyelids, and it created a tiny slit that he could actually look through. And what he saw terrified him. The surgeon was walking over next to him. He was getting his gloves on. And then the surgeon says, scalpel. And the nurse hands him this chrome metallic blade. And the surgeon takes the blade and begins out a fairly significantly sized hole. At which point the surgeon hands the scalpel to the nurse and says clamps. At which point the nurse hands him what looks like a torture device. And the surgeon proceeds to use these clamps to pin segments of Sherman's skin that has just been cut open to his body. To basically keep the hole oh. open. And then the surgeon began tugging on the outsides of this hole in Sherman's midsection making sure it was big enough that he could actually get a good look into his body and every little tug is sending lightning bolts of pain into Sherman's body but again all he can do is flick his eyes left and right and no one's paying attention scope the surgeon called out for and the nurse handed him a camera that he jammed into Sherman's gut and then the surgeon said suction and the nurse got what looked like a vacuum and pressed it inside of this open wound and began sucking out fluids from his body the pain Sherman was experiencing is unimaginable every second felt like an eternity forceps the surgeon called and the nurse handed him these metal prongs that he put inside of this hole in sherman's body and he used them to dislodge his gallbladder so he could get a he's in torture right now oh my goodness I better look at it by this point sherman wanted to die he was no longer flicking his eyes left and right he was just looking straight out hoping someone would finally see him and someone did. One of the nurses standing next to the surgeon looked up at Sherman's face and saw Thank God for that nurse, yo. Because, oh my God. 
the anesthesiologist and he calls him, get over here and fix this. And so the anesthesiologist comes running over from the side of the room. He gets up next to Sherman and begins pumping him full of painkillers. And as he's doing this, he has this moment of clarity. He remembers he didn't give him the anesthetic. And so as these Fire. new painkillers that have just been introduced begin to take their effect, Sherman's eyes go from being terrified to glazed over and he does pass off to sleep. And so now he's out and he can't feel anything. But now the anesthesiologist and the medical team realize they have a very big problem. Mm -hmm. This patient just experienced 16 minutes of surgery and felt all of it. And at the end of it, when he wakes up, he's going to remember it and he's probably going to file a lawsuit against the hospital. Mm -hmm. And so a decision was made. It's unclear if the anesthesiologist acted alone or if the entire team was in on this. But regardless, the anesthesiologist administered an additional drug after giving all these painkillers. This additional drug was called midazolam, but it's better known as the amnesia drug. And like its nickname implies, anyone who gets it will forget what has just happened to them. And so <laughs> they tried, they well tried. And the man remembered, so get your shmoney, get your shmoney, buddy, get your money, because that's not right. And they will try to cover it up. Get your money. So the idea was by giving him this amnesia drug, he won't remember the trauma he had suffered through during the surgery and so wouldn't file a lawsuit. And so after he was given this drug, the medical team, they went back to doing the surgery. They completed it and they got him back out to recovery. And then when Sherman woke up in recovery, he did not remember what had happened to him inside of the operating room, at least not consciously. Those horrible 16 minutes had been implanted on Sherman's subconscious. Basically, his body recognized that he had experienced extreme trauma. Mm -hmm. However, the amnesia drug wiped away the memory of how he received that trauma. Oh, so there's shoot. this big disconnect in his memory. And so when Sherman came to in the recovery room, he immediately sensed something was horribly, horribly wrong. He was scared. He was anxious. He had this incredible sense of dread, but he had no memory to tie these feelings to. Mm. And so as Sherman is sitting in recovery, he must have tried to kind of hide the way he was feeling because he didn't even remotely understand it. He had been completely happy and normal going into the surgery and now a couple of hours later he's a complete mess and so he leaves the hospital that day on january 19th he goes back to his house and he sits on the couch with his wife and as he's sitting there suddenly these horrible feelings he's having they become too much and he no wonder he was screaming like that no me as his wife i'd be like this is odd putting two to two together with the procedure I would be like on their ass to be honest because I don't know where all of a sudden he's starting to scream after he got the procedure done that is very weird become too much and he basically has a panic attack and he starts screaming out and he's terrified of something but he doesn't know what it is and then over the next couple of days he began having these flashbacks Good. where he would access Good. the actual 16 minutes of torture he went through that was God's sign he's like you know what He's slowly recovering. Just watch and then you get back in memory of what's happened. And look. But when he would see someone cutting into him and opening his chest up and sucking things out of it, he didn't think that happened to me and that's why I feel this way. Instead, he thought it was just this horrible nightmare that he couldn't escape from. And so his family did eventually start getting doctors and psychologists and all these people involved to figure out what was wrong with him. But before they could figure it out, the whole situation had just become too terrible for Sherman. And so on February 2nd, just two weeks after he came out of that surgery, he would take his own life. His family was unbelievably heartbroken. It didn't seem real that this had happened. And so they would continue to dig and dig and figure out what went wrong and they would finally get their hands on the medical report from the gallbladder exploratory surgery on january 19th and after giving it to another doctor to look over this doctor discovered that sherman had in fact experienced 16 minutes of something known as anesthesia awareness where you are awake or feel a portion of your oh surgery God. and shockingly this happens to 20,000 people a year
However, Sherman's case, forgetting the amnesia drug, just literally what he went through, 16 full minutes of this really intensive surgery that he felt, that is an absolute rarity. That does not happen very often. Sherman's family would go on to sue the yes. hospital and they would be awarded an undisclosed amount of money from the hospital in 2008. As so that's going to do it, guys. As they should, because this is not right. They should double, te double check, triple check the procedure of patients when they have to go under the knife. But oh, 20,000 people a year? Why is that so many? <sighs> Those 20,000 people better be suing them people there. Because mm -mm. that's why he is a perfect example why I do not like hospitals and doing anything going underneath the knife. Even needles. I can't tolerate needles. Even though that's a little one, like 1% one of pain i still don't rock with any needles or any cuts or any blood tests i couldn't do it this is too much i can't imagine what he gone through man man couldn't tolerate it anymore oh my god mr Ballin, you did it again and especially with them sound effects oh my god thank god I was not eating or anything like that because I would be so like, but yeah, if you guys enjoyed this video, give this video a thumbs up, subscribe, um, comment down below which story was the most intense story out of the three. Yeah, I'll catch you guys in the next video. Ooh, mess up my head top, but yeah.